Hello everyone, how's it going? Today I am going to be explaining to you crested gecko genetics, which are basically just like any other animal's genetics, but I'm going to be bringing them into the crested gecko world with crested gecko morphs and traits. The information and sources that I'm using in this video are either created by me or obtained from Morph Market, the Fluffy Dragons website and the Little Monsters website. Morph Market has a great Morphpedia for the crested geckos, although it is not fully finished. Lil Monsters has a really good Morphpedia and it has more morphs than the Morph Market one does. And the Fluffy Dragons website has incredible images that show perfectly how different morphs and traits are shown and expressed in Crested Geckos. So I'm using these images for my video and I'm editing some of the images to make morphs or traits that have not been included in the website. So thank you to these three websites and let's keep playing the video. First of all, I want to explain the difference between a morph and a trait. Basically, both of them are genetic mutations. The only ones who give them a difference are going to be breeders. So morphs are going to be something more general, like the whole pattern changes. For example, a harlequin, a flame, or a phantom, lily white, where there are really big changes in the gecko with that specific mutation. Now, a trait usually is referred to something that is a small and more individual mutation, such as how the structure of the gecko changes, like maybe the pinstriping or maybe also a color mutation such as white tip on the crests or maybe the portholes or the snowflakes. So those smaller mutations are considered traits while the more general mutations are considered morphs. I am separating them into two parts but they act the same way and for any mutation you're going to be doing it the same way as long as they are not polygenic. So before getting into crested gecko genetics, I want to explain some basic concepts which are going to be what is an allele, what is dominant, what is recessive, what is homozygous, what is heterozygous, what is incomplete dominant, what is recessive lethal. A dominant gene is going to be a gene that only needs one copy to express itself, so when we have an individual, it's going to be carrying one copy of each parent, so it's going to be either big A or small A from the dad, or either big A or small A from the mom. When you combine these two, you're going to have either big A, big A, either small A, small A, or either big A, small A. So big A, small A is going to be heterozygous, and homozygous is going to be the same allele. So it's, it can be homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. Homozygous dominant will be big A, big A, and homozygous recessive will be small A, small A. When you are looking to, into a dominant gene, you're going to see that the individuals with only one copy, meaning big A and small A, would express the gene, and the individuals with big A, big A would also express the gene, while the individuals with small A, small A will not express the gene and not carry the gene. When we're looking into a recessive mutation, big A, big A would not carry the gene, big A, small A would carry the gene, but not express the gene, and then small A, small A would express the gene and carry the gene. So it's carrying two copies, so for recessive you need to carry both copies in order to express, but you only need one copy in order to pass it on without expressing. Now incomplete dominance is the term that we use to refer to those mutations that have something in the middle. So the big A big A is going to be one thing, big A small A is going to be another thing, and small A small A is going to be another thing. An example of this would be the Dalmatian gene. The Dalmatian mutation has big A big A being super Dalmatian, big A small A being normal Dalmatian, and small A small A not Dalmatian. Now this gene is not proven out to be incomplete dominant, but there is thought to be some incomplete dominance. Some people think that more spots would be the super form, and there is thought to be some incomplete dominance, but it's not 100% proven. A gene that is commonly thought to be incomplete dominance is lady white. All lady whites are big A small A because the big A big A mutation dies. Some people think that they are going to be able to produce a lily white if they do it enough. That is not how it works because lily white is not an incomplete dominant gene, but it's a recessive lethal gene, meaning that when you get two copies of that gene, you're gonna die. So now that we have covered basic genetics, we can get into crested gecko genetics. So let's start with colorations. In colorations, we can get a black base, a yellow base, an orange base, a red base, an olive base, a lavender base, 
a charcoal, and then coal fusion. A black base is going to be dominant, which means that just one copy of it is necessary for it to express. And it basically creates a dark base on the crested gecko. A yellow base is also going to be dominant, and it's going to make the crested gecko body color to be yellow. The orange base is polygenic, which means that there's multiple genes that code for this mutation. So then we cannot use the method that we have been using to predict the orange base kits. The red base is recessive, but it's incomplete dominant. The red base, big A, big A, is going to be red. Big A, small A, is going to be a blush on the neck and smally smally is going to be no mutation for the olive it's also going to be polygenic and it's going to be a green body color now the lavender gene is an interesting gene it is also polygenic and it is hypomelanistic and this means that it is going to be expressing less pigmentation than the wild type which is going to be the black base if you think that you have a lavender and then you fire him up and then they show black, that's not going to be a lavender because lavenders cannot show the black color or the dark base. So lavenders fire up pretty much lavender or gray color. The charcoal is a polygenic. And it's basically when you have a dark base phantom and sometimes they might have some fringing or a white belly, but it's basically the combination between a phantom and a dark base. Cold fusion is also polygenic and it is blue hypo. So it's going to be hypomelanistic and the crested geckos with this gene look kind of like a bluish color. The first and easiest morph is the patternless or phantom crested gecko. It creates a crested gecko with no pattern and it is a recessive gene. Now we can also see bicolor crested geckos. This would be almost like a morph, but it is part of the phantom gene. When you have a patternless, it can be either bicolor or just one color. The bicolor is going to express a different color on the back of the crested gecko than the body of the crested gecko. Up until now, we have only seen crested gecko base colors, but as we all know, crested geckos have morphs. These morphs are determined by how the patterning is expressed. Crested geckos have either white or orange patterning. Then you can also have tricolors, which are polygenic. This gene makes a crested gecko have three colors. Maybe it can be dark base with a yellow and white. But you cannot confuse the white, for example, with portholes or snowflakes, which are a different trait and are not part of the tricolor gene. Other color combinations could be a red tricolor, which would have a red base, an orange patterning, and a white or cream color. The creamsicle, which would be an orange or yellow base color with some white or cream pattern. And the Halloween would be a dark base gecko with an orange patterning. For example, a harlequin with a dark base with some orange patterning would be considered a Halloween. Then you can have flames, which is when you see some pattern on the back and it's polygenic. Harlequin derives from the flame gene, so it's pretty much uh, the same, but you're going to see more patterning on the legs. Harlequin comes from the flame gene, but it has kind of evolved into an individual gene. You can actually have an extreme Harlequin, which is going to be how this gene expresses more or less. Another gene is going to be the strawberry blonde, which I have never seen. I just saw it in the little monsters page and it is polygenic. The strawberry blonde can be created out of a red base with a yellow pattern or a yellow base with a red tiger. The thing is, these guys are not as common because people are not breeding reds to yellows because most of the time you're gonna get a muddy color which is not really desired in the crested gecko world. But maybe in the future we see that more people breed them out. Maybe in the future I breed them out. We'll see. Then we get the tiger, which is going to be dominant and is going to be stripes in the back and the dorsal. Then the brindle is going to be a lower expression tiger. The quad stripe gene is like a pinstripe. Then we're going to see some cream lateral lines and it's going to be polygenic. Then the super stripe is going to be recessive and it is going to be a thick line along with the pinstripes on the back of the crested gecko and also the cream lateral line. So it's pretty much like a quad stripe with lines on the back. Then of course a lily white is going to be incomplete dominant Everyone calls it incomplete dominant, I call it recessive lethal because it is pretty much the name of the mutation but in the community it is known to be incomplete dominant but it is not fully true because if it was 
then big A big A would be something alive, but in this case big A big A is dead. So it's not. So let's do a cross between uh, Lily White and Lily White. You're gonna have big A small A and big A small A. The gametes are gonna be big A small A for both of them and the filler generation, so the kids, are going to be big A big A, big A small A, small A big A and small A small A. Which means that one out of the four kids is going to die, two out of the four kids are going to be Lily Whites and one out of the four kids is going to be not Lily White, not passing on the gene. Some people think that when you are breeding Lily White to Lily White, you're going to get more Lily Whites, but that's not true. Let's say that you breed a non-Lily White to a Lily White, you're still going to have 50% chances of getting a Lily White. And if you breed a Lily White to a Lily White, you're still going to get 50% chances of getting a Lily White. And one of the kids is going to die. So it's always going to be better to breed a non-Lily White to a Lily White than a Lily White to a Lily White. You're going to get more babies and you're not going to have to see dead babies in an egg. I also want to add that even if this is one of the most liked traits in the entire Gecko community, it is still one of the least understood genes in the community and not biologically, but just because of all the rumors and misconceptions that are out there. The Lily White trait is really simple and plain. It is a recessive lethal, so it's not incomplete dominant, it is not co-dominant, it is not dominant, it is not recessive, it is recessive lethal. Just so the people know, you cannot breed a Lily White and a Lily White together and expect that you're going to magically hatch out a baby. I mean, before I studied genetics, I thought that I could do that. I thought like, maybe if I try hard enough, I'm going to get a, a super Lily White. That is not true. Uh, it's, it's just like, it's not possible. That gene is going to kill the Crested Gecko if it has two copies. So if you think that you can maybe create a super Lily White, you're uneducated and you should maybe try to read a little bit about basic genetics, what is uh, recessive lethal mutation, and maybe try to do better hopefully i've heard so many but so so many misconceptions about the lily white mutation some people have told me that if you breed a lily white to a lily white yes they die but the actual lily whites like the ones that did not die are going to have health problems doesn't make sense i mean they're just carrying one copy like that's the only thing that is happening and it's not true like they're not going to be less healthy another misconception i've heard is that if you mix uh, like two harlequins together you can get a lily white that is not how it works you're not going to get a mutation and out of two harlequins that are going to make a lily white that's not how it works you need one copy of lily white to make a, a lily white you can't make a lily white out of nowhere and then i've also heard that some people have made the super form and that the problem with the super form is that it cannot produce fertile offspring that just doesn't make sense have you ever seen a super form of a lily white crested gecko because i haven't and even so like what it does it's it kills a parent it's not limiting the reproductive ability it is killing the parent you know so it's going to be killing well the baby because it never gets to be a parent there's so so many misconceptions about lily whites I don't know, like, it's just simple. If you breed a Lily White to a Lily White, one out of four dies, two of them are Lily White. One is going to be recessive, which means that it's not gonna express uh, the gene or it's not gonna carry the gene. Now, the Exanthic is recessive. It's going to create a dark crusted gecko because what it does is it eliminates the yellow pigment. So it's really cool how Xanthophores work. And then the cappuccino is incomplete dominant though, so there is a super form. So big A big A is gonna be one thing, while big A small A is a different thing. The super form is going to be melanistic. The way to know if it's a cappuccino, you're going to see like a little V at the tail, and then it's going to be like a really bright white, right where the tail starts and it's going to fade away. And then the body is dark. A frappuccino is going to be the combination of a cappuccino with a lily white. So it's going to be like a dark crested gecko with some nice white contrast. And it's not the same thing than an exanthic lily white. Then the sable is really interesting. I really like it. It's kind of new gene. And then it is an incomplete dominant. So the big A, big A is going to be one thing. Big A, small A is going to be a different thing. And small A, small A it's not gonna be a sable or carry the gene. And what it's gonna do is pretty much some white um, pattern on the crests, like really thick white collar on the crests. 
Sables also change drastically from the moment they're born until the subadult or adult stage. You can see that the orange colors are lost and the white and dark colors are enhanced. The super form also looks like cappuccinos and this gene is thought to be related to the cappuccino gene. Then we're going to go for traits, which as I said before is the smaller mutations, the genes that affect less the crested gecko and that you might not even notice sometimes that your crested gecko has. So let's start with the Dalmatian, this one is a pretty obvious one. I didn't put it in the morphs because I think it's more of a trait. Because uh, you can have a Harlequin Dalmatian, you can have a Flame Dalmatian, you can have a Lily White Dalmatian, you can have a lot of things with Dalmatian, but for example you cannot have an Exanthic Harlequin, you know, so, so morphs are more the things that are one thing and then you can add on several traits. And you can have pretty much as many traits as you can, but a morph is a combination of traits that cannot be mixed with another morph. So the Dalmatian is going to be incomplete dominant. It's not fully proven out to be incomplete dominant, but there is thought to be some incomplete dominance in it. So it is thought to be that the big A big A it has more spots than the big A small A, but there has not been noticed such a big difference like you would see in a super cap or a normal cap you know so cappuccinos as we said before are incomplete dominant and the difference between a super cap and a cap is really noticeable while the difference between the super form of a dalmatian is not going to be as noticeable with a normal dalmatian when we're talking genetically now you can get some dalmatians that only have five spots and you can get some Dalmatians that have like 150 spots. You obviously notice a difference between those two, but maybe genetically, both of them have the same genes, you know? As you know, crested geckos have been on the market for a few years, maybe 30 years, 40 years. So there's not a lot of research on crested geckos or crested gecko genetics. There's also a lot of new mutations, so we will be seeing how people start to prove out certain genes. I think maybe in the future I will be breeding purposely to prove out genes. I don't know. But anyways, now the Dalmatian spots, you should not confuse them with cluster spots or oil spots or ink blots. Cluster spots is when a Dalmatian has spots that are really clustered and this is also a gene so it's individual so it is a gene that is going to affect the dalmatian gene the oil spot is going to be polygenic as well and it's like green spots on the body it's just it's kind of like the dalmatian one but it's it's more like a greenish color and then they are fading away then we also have the confetti which is the red spots which are pretty interesting i think there's not a lot of confettis out there then you have the ink blot which is the which is also polygenic and it is what we refer to the big big spots. The pinstripe is going to be dominant and it's going to be a mutation that affects the back of the crested gecko. It is a structural mutation so it's not going to be color but it's going to make the stripes on the back is going to make like a row like a mountain of like little spikes. Because the thing about pinstripes is they kind of have like one row of stripes if you had more than one row, it would be called furred. So like a furry gecko or or a furred crested gecko is going to be like the big pinstripes and then there's going to be like more than one row. So it's like less ordered pinstripes. The next gene is going to be chevron, which I don't know why people don't breed this one out. I kind of like it. It is polygenic and it makes S shapes in the back. The soft scale is going to be incomplete dominant. We're going to see fewer bumps or scales on the skin than most crested geckos have, and the color is enhanced and the lines look more clean. White wool is an incomplete dominant gene, and it's going to create a solid white wool on the lateral, like the sides of the crested geckos. Then the portholes is going to be a polygenic gene, which is going to create white spots on the sides of the crested gecko and sometimes on the legs, and you should not confuse this gene with the snowflakes. Snowflakes is an incomplete dominant or even maybe epistatic. Epistasis is when you need another gene for that gene to express and then it's going to be creating white spots similar to the portholes but these ones grow with age. 
Drippy is tied to snowflakes. Drippy is polygenic and it is going to be white colored dorsal and it is most common on harlequins, tricolors, pinstripes and lily whites. The blushing mutation is basically the same mutation than red and is going to be the heterozygous form for red. You're going to see a red neck or a pink or orange neck. These are thought to be the heterozygous form for the red mutation. Tangerine is incomplete dominant and it infuses the animal's color with orange. Then you can also have some other structural genes that are bold or crowned. These are polygenic. The crown gene is thought to be passed on with ease. So let's say that you have a really nice crested gecko, but it does not have a good head structure. If you pair that crested gecko up with a crested gecko that has a good head structure, most of the babies are going to have really good head structure. The crowned gene is thought to be passed on pretty easily. So that's a good thing for us because we want crested geckos with really nice spikes, really nice head size, and really nice head shape, like short snout and big crests. It is what it is thought to be nice in the crested gecko world, and it's what people want to see in the crested gecko world. There's another trait called white tip. It is polygenic, and it's going to be similar to sable, but it's not related to sable, and it's going to create white tips on the crested gecko crests. You can also have orange tips, which is also polygenic, and it's going to be the same thing, but with orange. Then lastly, I want to talk about the French and kneecaps. French is going to be when the crested gecko has uh, like a white line on the back of the leg and it is going to be polygenic. And the kneecaps is pretty much the same thing, but on the kneecaps. It's also polygenic and it's going to be a white line on the knee of the crested gecko. I also want to add that I know the existence of the pixel morph and I am just not adding it on this video because I am not 100% sure on how it works. Some people think it's incomplete dominant and there's a super form where there is a lot of expression of the pixel morph. Some people think it's recessive and that the super form is actually not a super form, it's just how much the gene is expressing itself. Since I do not work with pixels and I have never seen one in my entire life, I am not going to have an opinion on this and I am just going to leave it to people who have pixels to discover if this trait is incomplete dominant or recessive or a different thing. Now we're going to practice some Punnett scores and we're going to get into genetics more in depth rather than just the phenotypes so that you can predict your offspring more accurately. So let's say we go ahead and make this cross between a phantom, which is homozygous recessive with this lily white, which is heterozygous for phantom, meaning that the phantom gene has been passed on in his family. The parents would be small a small a and big a small a. The gametes are gonna be the different letters that we have. So in the small a small a, we only have small a, so the gamete is gonna be small a, but on the big A small a, the gametes are going to be big A and small a because we have both copies. If it was big A big A, it would be only big A. So we're going to arrange the gametes to make a Punnett square, which is this table, and we're going to be putting the gamete of one parent to the side and the gamete of the other parents on top, and we are going to cross them. After crossing homozygous recessive with a heterozygous, we're going to get one heterozygous and one homozygous recessive. So we're going to pretty much get the same thing that the parents are. We're going to get one heterozygous phantom, which means that it has a phantom gene, but it does not express it. So it's going to be carried on. And we're going to have a visual phantom, which means that it's a phantom or a patternless. Let's cross a crusted gecko with no copies of the phantom gene with a crested gecko with only one copy of the phantom gene. Half of the babies are not going to have the phantom gene, while half of the babies are going to be heterozygous for the phantom gene. This means that all of the crested geckos that we're going to obtain from this pairing are not going to look phantom, but half of them are going to be heterozygous for phantom. Now let's do the cross between a non-phantom with not the gene and not the allele, so it's not carrying the phantom gene at all, and the phantom. We're gonna have the gametes are gonna be big A for the non-phantom and small A for the phantom. So we cross them and it's gonna be 100% all of them heterozygous for phantom. We're not gonna get any visual phantoms and all of the kids are gonna be carrying the phantom gene. Now that one was pretty easy, let's go for a two heterozygous phantoms. Our parents are going to be big A small A and big A small A. So the gametes are going to be big A small A for both of them. We make the Punnett square and we're going to be getting 
big A, big A, big A, small A, big A, small A, small A, small A. So what this means is that we're going to get one not head, not phantom, which means that it does not carry the phantom gene at all, two heterozygous for phantom, and one homozygous recessive, which is phantom. Now let's say that a female crested gecko laid, and out of four eggs, this was completely accurate, one was phantom, and then there was three babies that are not phantom visually, but they might carry the gene. If we see the Punnett square, we see that one out of the three not phantom kids does not even carry the gene. Now this means that two out of the three not phantom crested geckos are heterozygous for phantom. This is where the 66% possible head phantom crested geckos come from. There is a chance of 2 in 3 crested geckos out of this pairing to be phantom. So 2 thirds is 66.666666%. Now let's say we cross a phantom to a phantom. The gametes are gonna be small a for both of the parents. And all of the kids are going to be phantoms. All of these previous examples work on this gene because it's a recessive gene and it will work the same way on other recessive genes. Now we're going to see how to make Punnett squares on different types of genes. Now that we know how recessive genes act, let's see how dominant genes act. Dominant genes only need one copy for the trait to be expressed. The dark base gene is a dominant gene. In a pairing of two homozygous dominant for the dark base gene, all the kids we're gonna get are gonna be dark based homozygous dominant because the only alleles that are being passed is the capital A. Similarly, in a pairing of a homozygous dominant with a homozygous recessive for the dark base gene, all of the kids that we're gonna get are dark based. However, these dark base kids are all going to be heterozygous which means that they only have one copy for the dark base gene. A pairing between a crested gecko without the dark base gene and the crested gecko that has one copy of the dark base gene, we're going to get half of the babies heterozygous for the dark base and half of the babies with no dark base copies. In a pairing of a homozygous dominant with a heterozygous for the dark base gene, we're going to get two different genotypes but just one phenotype. Half of the babies are going to be homozygous dominant and half of the babies are going to be heterozygous. This means that half of the babies are going to carry both copies of the gene and half of the babies are going to carry just one copy of the gene. In a pairing of two heterozygous for the dark base gene, we're going to get three different genotypes and two different phenotypes. This means that visually we're only going to get either dark base or no dark base, but genetically we have some differences. One fourth of the babies is going to be homozygous dominant, meaning that they have two copies of the gene. Two fourths of the babies are going to be heterozygous, which are going to be dark base, but only one copy of the gene is present. And one fourth of the babies is going to be homozygous recessive, meaning that they are not going to be dark base. The genotypic ratio is going to be 1 to 2 to 1, while the phenotypic ratio is going to be 3 to 1. Now we're going to see how incomplete dominant genes work and how to predict offspring out of an incomplete dominant gene. Just to refresh your minds, an incomplete dominant gene is a gene that has a superform. One copy is going to create something, while two copies is going to create the superform of that same gene. Now Dalmatian isn't the best example because it is not proven out to be this way. There is thought to be some incomplete dominance, but it is not 100% sure. A gene that is proven out to be incomplete dominant is the white out or white wall gene. One copy of the gene is going to make this white pattern, while two copies of the gene are going to make a thick white wall on the lateral of the crested gecko. In a pairing of a homozygous dominant with a homozygous recessive, we're gonna get all of the kids heterozygous. This means that a white walled parent with a parent that has no copies of the gene is going to make all wired out kids. In a pairing of two homozygous dominants, we're always going to get all of the kids homozygous dominant because the only gamete being passed on is capital A. This means that out of a pairing of two white walls, we're going to get all white wall kids. In a pairing of a heterozygous with a homozygous recessive, we're going to get heterozygous and homozygous recessives. This means that out of a pairing of a white out parent with a no copies of the gene parent is going to give us half of the kids white out and half of the kids will have no copies. In a pairing of a heterozygous with a homozygous dominant, 
we're going to get half of the babies homozygous dominant and half of the babies heterozygous. This means that out of a pairing of a white out with a white wall, we're going to get half white outs and half white walls. In a pairing of two heterozygous, we're going to get one homozygous dominant, one homozygous recessive, and two heterozygous. This means that when we breed a white out to a white out, we're going to get one white wall, two white outs, and one of the babies is going to have no copies of the gene. Both the phenotypic ratio and the genotypic ratio are going to be 1 to 2 to 1. Recessive lethal genes work exactly the same way than incomplete dominant genes. This is why they are often confused. However, incomplete dominant genes have a superform that is alive and recessive lethal genes have a superform that is not alive. Two copies of the gene are going to kill the kid. In a pairing of a lily white to a non lily white, we're gonna get half of the kids lily white and half of the kids not lily white. Lily white is a gene that only has one copy because two copies of the gene are going to kill the crested gecko. That's why we only have two options of what to breed a lily white with. We can only breed a lily white with a non lily white or a lily white with a lily white. And the safest and best option is always going to be breeding a lily white with a non lily white. Breeding a lily white to a lily white is going to kill one of the four babies, but let's see how this would work. One of the four babies is going to be big A big A, two of the four kids are going to be big A small A, and one out of the four kids is going to be small A small A. This means that half of the babies are going to be lily white, and one fourth of the babies is going to be not lily white. The other fourth of the babies is going to be dead. I don't want to get into codominance because crested geckos don't have any codominant traits of my knowledge. Now I'm going to explain how it will work if there's any of you that has some curiosity. Let's say that the lily white trait was codominant with the unicorn horn trait. Out of a pairing of a horn lily white with a horn lily white, we're going to get one lily white, two horn lily whites, and one just horned. Codominance brings two genes into play. And it explains how 1 out of 4 is going to have one gene, 1 out of 4 is going to have the other gene, and 2 out of 4 is going to have both genes at the same time. We are now getting to the end, and hopefully you have learned something. This means that we can do Punnett scores with several genes, not just one. Most crested geckos don't have just one gene. Most crested geckos are not just lady white, or are not just Dalmatian, or are not just phantom. Most crested geckos will have several genes coming into play. For example, a phantom lily white with Dalmatian and confetti spots. We would be seeing four genes coming into play, and we could predict the kids by doing a Punnett score that involves the four genes. So let's try out a pairing of a red not lily white crested gecko with a lily white crested gecko with the blushing mutation, which means that it is heterozygous for red. The gametes are going to be all the possible combinations that we can make between these two letters. R stands for red and L stands for lily. The gametes for our red not lily are going to be capital R and small l, while the gametes for our blushing lily are going to be capital R, capital L, capital R, small l, small r, capital L, small r, small l. The four different babies that we're going to have are one red lily white, one red not lily white, one heterozygous red which means that it's going to have a blush with lily white and one heterozygous red which means it's going to have a blush and not lily white. We can obviously make this harder and pair up a heterozygous red not lily with a heterozygous red lily. The gametes are going to be capital R small l small r small l for the first parent and big r big l big r small l small r big l small r small l for the second parent we're going to have six possible phenotypes and genotypes there are two that are repeated we're going to have one red lily white one red not lily white two heterozygous red lily white that blush two heterozygous red with no lily white that blush one not red lily white and one not red not lily white so the phenotypic and genotypic ratio are both going to be one to one to 2 to 2 to 1 to 1. Out of a pairing of two heterozygous for both genes, so big R, small r, big L, small l for both of the parents, we're going to get the following gametes. Big R, big L, big R, small l, small r, big L, small r, small l for both of the parents. The kids we're going to have are a dead super lily white red crested gecko, two red lily white crested geckos, one red not lily white crested gecko, 
2 dead heterozygous red super lily, 4 head red lily, 2 head red not lily, 2 not red lily, 1 dead not red super lily, and the homozygous recessive for both genes, no red, no lily. The phenotypic and genotypic ratios we're going to get are 1 to 1 to 2 to 2 to 4 to 2 to 2 to 1 to 1. As I mentioned before, you can add as many genes as you want, but it's obviously going to get harder to make a Punnett square with a lot of genes. This is just 3 genes and we get 64 possibilities. In this case, I am doing a heterozygous for the 3 genes that are red, lily and dalmatian. I had the decency to give you the gametes and to write down all of the possibilities in this table. As you might know, this video has taken me a lot of time to make. It's taken me about 25 hours of filming and editing. I've made a lot of slides. I've edited a lot of crested gecko images. I've made my own crested gecko images so that I can show you guys better how these genes work and pass on. I am no expert here. I have some level of education in genetics and I want to share my knowledge with you. I am definitely not the best teacher, so uh, after watching the video several times, I think that I have not properly given my message. However, maybe some of you understand it. And as long as some of you learn something today and see this video as a helpful video, I'm going to be happy. And I hope that this video covers up pretty much everything that is out there on Crested Geckos. There are obviously genes getting discovered every year or every two years. Maybe some are minor genes, maybe some are not bred successfully. But there are genes that are going to be added on in the crested gecko world during the next 10 years. So this video pretty much covers up everything up to 2024. I hope I didn't miss anything. If I did, please comment it. And this video was just like a a guide to tell you which trait acts in which way, like which trait is dominant, recessive, incomplete dominant, or recessive lethal, and then show you how to predict your offspring with a Punnett square so that you can do this in your own crested gecko lab, or crested gecko facility, or crested gecko room, or your three crested gecko tubs. It's not going to change depending if you have more or less crested geckos. This is also used for other animals, let's say that, I don't know much about bull pythons, but let's say that there is a recessive gene in bull pythons, it is going to be passed on just like any other recessive gene in crested geckos. So it might have the 66% possible head, uh, maybe clown or I don't know. I think the clown is recessive, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know much about bull pythons. So what I'm trying to say here is that these things that I'm showing you today in this video can be used for other things and hopefully you stop uh, being a breeder that just does things phenotypically and knows the genotypes of your crested geckos. This is useful because you're going to get the crested geckos that you want and maybe out of a pairing that you are expecting some nice kids, you're going to get bad kids or the kids that you're not expecting because you are not sure in how genetics work. So hopefully this video taught you a lesson on how to breed animals and how to pair up and how genetics work and how some traits are being passed on. And there are differences in traits. I've only shown you guys four or five. I've shown you dominant, recessive, incomplete dominant, recessive lethal and co-dominance. So hopefully these are enough for you to breed in your own small uh, breeding facility or, or house or room or whatever. If you guys can support us by liking the video and commenting and subscribing, I would really appreciate that. And I'll see you guys in the next video.